to welcome everybody and tell you how happy we are that, that you've joined this meeting because the topic is incre incredibly important to birds, or not, not only just here, but around the world. So I'm gonna share our screen and get this up. Is everybody seeing that okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, up I'm at the end of it. Okay. Um, so around October 2011, the New Yorker ran this cartoon. And some of us were a little offended because we'd been spending our lives trying to cure this tragic problem. And here was some guy making light of it in the New Yorker. And then we realized we should be happy because 20 years prior to this, nobody would have understood the, the, the reference. And so it had make, made itself into the public consciousness in a way that the New Yorker could make a joke about it. So since then, there have been two important studies that are relevant to this topic. Um, the first is a report that came out in Science recently, um, October 2019, that's the most recent documentation of the loss of our birds in, in North America. The chart on the left shows the overall loss of breeding birds from the period of 1970 to the present. In other words, we've lost nearly 3 billion breeding birds uh, over that time. The chart on the right shows what types of birds we've lost. Um, and you will see that grassland birds have suffered the biggest loss. The little map on the left shows where the grasslands are. They're basically in the middle of the country. But our birds, which, are, which would be considered the Eastern forest birds, have lost um, almost 20%. And when you look at the um, number of species affected, almost two thirds of our species have been affected. So this is why we need to be concerned about every bird that dies at a building. Uh, this is a chart from that, I mean, a little graphic from that report that illustrates for the layman just the gravity of the situation. Uh, the second um, report was actually a report. This, this graph is from the report, but it's kind of derivative. Um, the actual report was in 2013, and it was performed by um, Peter Mara and Scott Loss, both of the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute, and Tom Will of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and it was funded by Fish and Wildlife. And the purpose of this report was to determine how many birds cats were killing every year. Up to that point, we'd assumed that windows were the most common anthropogenic cause of mortality in birds, um, separate, second really to habitat loss, which is a worldwide problem. But this report determined that cats are actually worse than, than windows for birds. Um, 2.6 billion cats and, and some say 3.7 billion now. And the common figures used for windows are somewhere between 300 um, million and 1 billion birds a year killed by windows. Way down on the line are industrial collisions. Those are things like water, wastewater pools from oil and gas refining facilities, uh, wind turbines, communication towers, and, um, and uh, power, power lines. So Lizbeth will talk a little about how lights out our Lights Out program fits into all of this. Thank you. Yeah, so Lights Out DC is a citizen science project. We're an all volunteer organization. Volunteers go out in the early mornings during migratory season. So usually about April and May in the spring migration and then early September to uh, early November in the fall looking for victims of window collisions. 
um, when we locate um, a bird, if it's been killed, volunteers place it in a plastic bag. They record information like where it was found, what time it was found, the date on which it was found, the address of where it was found. Um, and they place it in a plastic bag and we collect these birds. If the bird has been injured by the collision, which um, at least with in Lights Out program here is a small fraction of the birds, but if they're injured, we place it, uh, we net it, we place it in a paper bag that has a napkin in the bottom. This allows the bird to be quiet and safe. Um, and then we'll transport it to city wildlife to be checked out by a veterinarian. Um, if you were to leave the bird, um, the stunned bird there, it could be eaten by a crow or a gull. Um, unfortunately, they also get run over by cars and stepped on. So you have to, um, to, to take careful care of the, of the birds that have been injured. Um, we have a permit through the US Fish and Wildlife to do this. And obviously our goal is to document the problem um, here in DC. Next slide in. This gives you some sense of our of where we monitor. It's a small area of downtown DC. We have two routes. One route is called the Union Station route and that is obviously on the lower right hand corner. It starts, um, you'll see where Union Station is. Uh, the building mark number one is the Thurgood Marshall building. Um, so the Union Station route goes from there around where it says five, two and three and sort of back to Union Station. Um, you can see the, the road that goes sort of on the diagonal through this, this image is Massachusetts Avenue. And so our second route is called Chinatown route and that is up by four, which is 800 and K complex. Um, above it is the Washington Convention Center. So um, seven days a week, we have volunteers that go out and monitor these areas looking for window collisions. Um, the, Numbered buildings are buildings where we tend to find a larger number of birds. And we also have some volunteers that monitor off route. So for example, where there's all the building going on right now in the first street Northeast area near the Shaw Metro, we have volunteers that check that out. And then concerned citizens also bring us birds or report seeing uh, window collisions. Thanks, Anne. Next slide. Um, so what do we do? So once volunteers have collected the birds, they enter the information about the birds into a database that we've created. Um, and at the end of the year, what you're seeing here is um, we bring all the birds together. We double check the actual birds against the data that's been entered. We make sure that they're correctly identified and we tag them with the number, all of which is connected to our, our, our data. Um, and that way, when we donate the birds to the Smithsonian or to other um, organizations that use these birds for study purposes, they know where the bird um, is from and they have that information that they can use. So for example, when there was a study done um, by Scott Loss and Pete Mara and um, others, they use some of our data to help sort of figure out how many birds were um, colliding with windows. So this was a, a useful data for them to have. Um, next, Sam. And so once they're tagged, we take a photograph of the birds. And this we found is very uh, powerful. And it, part of our goal is to collect the data to, to move people to action. Um, we find these photographs to be very powerful. What you're looking at is from our first year of collecting um, birds as part of a Lights Out DC. This was in 2010. Just to give you some sense, um, the birds furthest to the right are, th are thrush. Um, and then you see on the on far left side, there's some woodcock. Um, and then down at the bottom, you'll see our, our smallest birds that we find, which are hummingbirds. And next slide, please. So here's 2016. So you can just see visually, we find more and more birds each year. Um, so for example, in 2020, last year, we found 665 birds for the whole year. And we did not have our monitoring program running during the spring. Um, that was because of, of COVID. So um, the bulk of the birds that we found last year were actually during the fall. And again, to orient you in this picture, um, in the foreground, those are mostly uh, sparrow species. Anne mentioned earlier that the grassland birds are, are 
um, spare, for example, like sparrows are hard hit by um, these, these problems. In the, in the background, in the far back, you see some warbler species um, to the right or more woodcock. And I don't know if people can tell, but kind of in um, the large bird there is a hawk. Um, and, um, and so just to give that, that some sense, like visually you saw that there was a change between 2010, 2016, and Anne's put together this graph to show that we have, again, this is a sort of small area of downtown DC that we focus on. And you'll see that over time, we found more and more birds. That's what the gray is representing. The blue is um, five buildings that have been on our route for the entire time that Lights Out DC has has been in operation. And you'll notice that those numbers stay fairly steady in terms of the percentage of the whole. That suggests that um, there's a greater density of buildings. And if you've all been down in that area around Chinatown along Massachusetts Avenue, you know there's a huge amount of building going on with glass. And I think our numbers represent that. Next, please. Um, and so which birds are affected? We have um, found in Lights Out DC that it's the same birds that are affected that other lights out organizations find. That includes like white-throated sparrows, which is the bird on the top right. Um, and then the, in the far corner on the left side, that's an oven bird, which is a, a typical window collision victim. It's a small type of warbler, um, sometimes mistaken for a thrush. And could you go back for one second? I'm sorry. That's all right. Um, and then I wanted to point out, particularly in the corner, the two birds there, those are common yellow throats, again, a type of warbler. So they're very, very small. And they were actually found like this, literally on the ground, um, facing each other in front of a window. And, you know, it just really strikes us in these moments that birds like this have in this case have flown all the way from Central America only to die here in DC. And I think that really brings home kind of the tragedy that this represents. Um, next please, Anne. Um, there are also other um, birds that are affected. Some of the really spectacular birds that people think about, the Scarlet Tanager, which will, that's the one on the top right hand, the red bird, um, that's the male species. It would have come up from South America um, during um, right now from the in the spring migration. Um, you see a flicker there. So woodpeckers are also affected by this. It's generally neotropical migrants that we find, um, songbirds, um, perching birds that you see here. Um, and one thing that that it's it's quite clear from um, people that have studied this is that it's a glass. Um, kills indiscriminately. So we're not only sort of killing the weak or the sick bird, right? This takes out birds in their prime of their sort of reproductive life. So for example, when we find scarlet tanager, male ones like this, um, which I, I have found, um, you know, this is a bird that can no longer reproduce. I mean, it's, it's really um, uh, if impacting birds of all ages. Um, one year we had the Maryland Ortho Ornithological Society come and look at our birds to see if it were just mainly young birds that were impacted by the, um, by the glass, but they found that it was different age birds. So it wasn't just the young birds that were having problems with glass, it was all birds that were having problems. Next please, Anne. Um, so this is a, um, a graphic from FLAP, which is Fatal Light Awareness Program in Canada, just to give you some ideas about um, bird movement. So in the, in, the, in the visual on the left-hand side, that's showing you the flyways um, that birds travel up and down during migra migratory periods. So we are on the Atlantic Flyway, which is the blue lines. You'll notice that um, birds are coming up from the Caribbean, from South and Central America, and um, the flyway kind of converges in the mid-Atlantic and then diverges there. So we end up getting a lot of birds up through our area. Um, and you'll see that that, you know, is proportionally more than, for example, they get on the West Coast. And then the, the graph on the bottom is showing um, kind of uh, spikes in migration. This is again from Canada, but um, our, our findings are fairly similar, which is that you'll see like 
um, late April, early May, you have more birds um, impacting, getting you know hit into the glass. Um, and then again, in during the fall, it's like um, mid to, to late September into early October that you'll see um, higher numbers of collisions. And those particular spikes are usually related to um, like weather related. So if there's like um, low cloud cover or, or a lot of rain or wind, sometimes the birds, um, they fly lower during those periods or more attracted to lights, have more problems with glass. So it's definitely often we find um, weather related when they strike. Thank you, Anne. Um, and someone was asking about this in the chat. So yes, you can see uh, the bird activity on radar. So what we're looking at here is a representation. Zoom class I'm supposed to be on. Um, from, could someone please? Um, okay, so what we have here, um, so the, the light blue and dark blue are actually bird activity and the, the the dark blue are like hot spots, so we have a lot of birds migrating. The yellow and the green is uh, actually the weather that's showing up on the radar. So you can see that the birds here, this is in early, early May 2011, they're coming up from like Mexico, um, they're coming up from the Caribbean, um, up along the Atlantic Flyway. And DC is under um, one of those big, some of the heavier blue in this uh, representation. And after um, I'm finished speaking, I will pop in some links to this so you can actually see um, the, the radar that people use to judge what Barbara was talking about earlier about like when my migration might be higher or busier, they, um, they use this radar to help determine that. Next please, Anne. happen here. Oh, it's your turn, Ann. Okay. Um, so let's look at the reasons for, for these collisions. Um, there are several reasons. Lisbeth alluded to the fact that they're attracted to night lights. Birds do migrate at night. Uh, most passerines do anyway. And that's because there are fewer predators, the, the air is generally cooler, and there's generally less wind. Um, they also have poor depth perception, and we'll get into that. But the bottom line is they really can't see where they're going too well. Um, and then they don't see the glass itself. And the characteristics of glass that make it hazardous are that it's both transparent and reflective. So in terms of night lighting, um, this has been heavily researched. The slide on the lower right just shows a snapshot of what America looks like at night, typically. Um, the slide on the upper right is a three minute time lapse showing the rotation of the constellations around Polaris, the North Star. Polaris is fixed over the North Pole. And as the Earth rotates, the, um, the constellations are, appear to be rotating around the North Star. And so birds have two ways of navigating during the night. Um, they navigate by the position of the uh, constellations relative to the North Star, and they also navigate by um, the magnetic fields of, of the Earth. And that's been highly studied and is still somewhat in doubt, but they appear to have magnetite or magnetic receptors, certainly in their brains and possibly in their beaks that help them orient to the magnetic poles of the earth. So the slide on the left is pretty dramatic. This is, these are the, this is the tribute to light that uh, New York puts up every 9-11 as a memorial to the tragedy. And unfortunately, or fortunately, it's 9-11, it's which is the height of the fall migration season, which as you saw from Lisbeth's charts is the bigger migration season because all the young birds are coming down from um, the North. So what happened, what's found to happen at the Tribute to Light is that these birds are attracted by the beams and then they get kind of mesmerized by the beams and they just fly around within the beams. And so what New York has to do is periodically they turn off these beams for 20 minute intervals to free all the birds once again and then they turn them back on again. 
Some cities like Chicago have instituted voluntary lights out programs. Chicago has a particularly high number of collisions because it's on the central flyway, which is a big flyway, and it's on a, on a lake. And that means that a lot of migratory birds pass over Chicago. Um, and the combination of tall buildings and lights make it particularly hazardous. But somewhere around, I think it was around 1995, Chicago instituted a voluntary lights out program. And this is Chicago before and after uh, the voluntary program. It has high compliance um, and is pretty amazing because it is all voluntary. To prove that light was a problem in lit buildings, the Field Museum undertook this study in Chicago at McCormick Place, which is right on the river, I mean, on the lake. And it's, it's the worst building in Chicago, or was. Um, the Field Museum lit an equal number of buildings and kept an equal number unlit. And they found that 1,297 birds hit the lighted windows and 197 birds hit the unlighted windows, proving that light itself was a hazard um, to birds. So in terms of their depth perception, generally birds have much better eyesight than we do. They perceive colors more sharply. Um, they have a much better reaction time because they're prey species. Um, and their eyes are a bigger proportion in, of their head. Birds' eyes uh, occupy about 15% of the surface area of their head and ours only occupy about 2%. So generally they can see better, but in terms of depth perception, they're far worse. And that's because their eyes are on the sides of their heads and ours are uh, focused forward. So if you look at the charts at the bottom, you'll see that um, the human has 120 degrees of, of uh, binocular vision, which is the green area on the chart and only 40% of peripheral vision because our predators aren't generally coming from the side if we have predators at all. Um, the bird, on the other hand, with lots of predators, has only 28% of binocular vision, and all the rest is either rear vision or, or uh, peripheral vision. So that's why when they're flying, they simply don't really see where they're going. Some birds are especially prone to collisions. For the most part, we can't tell why some birds hit glass more than others. And as Lisbeth pointed out, they certainly do. If you look at the species that, that were um, impacted in, in all lights out programs of the, around the country, which by the way, there are about 33 now lights out programs in different cities, just like ours. Um, the species are always the same. You know, the white-throated sparrow, the oven bird, the, the yellow throat, it, they pop up in every, every city where they're native. Um, but one bird really illustrates the problem from the physiologic point of view, and that's the woodcock. The woodcock has three features that make it prone to collision. First, you can see where its eyes are. They're, this is what gives it its droll appearance. Its eyes are really far back along the side of its head and very high up on its head. And that's because the woodcock spends most of its time poke, with its head in the ground, poking around into the leaf litter looking for bugs. And so its predators are gonna be up really high above them. Um, so they don't, their peripheral vision is, I mean, their binocular vision is terrible. They, they really can't see where they're going. Um, the second reason is that their beak is very long. So the com combination of poor binocular vision and a very long beak means that that beak impacts the glass first, long before they ever see the glass. And um, just parenthetically, we found at the clinic that most of the bird collisions die, not everyone thinks, oh, they broke its neck. Well, that is not the case. They die from concussion usually. The beak is pushed back into the skull from the collision and they die of a concussion or a contusion. Uh, Frequently also, they have eye injuries. So sadly, sometimes even when the bird is survived and we bring it to city wildlife, we can't release it because it may be blind in one eye and it, and it won't survive in the wild. So the mortality is huge of all these birds. It's only about 16% get released. Um, and the, the last reason that the woodcock 
suffers collisions is that it has a huge acceleration rate. Um, they fly really fast and they accelerate really fast. So we've actually witnessed, some of our volunteers have actually witnessed um, a bird that was a woodcock that would, had landed and was spooked by something and just took up, took off like a shot right into glass. They just, they're incredibly fast. So then we go to the whole characteristics of glass itself, the, the transparency and the reflectivity of glass. And these are pictures I stole from websites abroad. One's from Spain and one, the blue one is from Australia. And you can see that architects around the world, even in the United States, are enamored of glass. We happen to be in a, an, a period of architecture when glass is the most treasured building material. And we all love light and we all love windows and scenery, but sometimes we're going too far if we really want to protect the environment. So um, the slide, the lower slide from Australia says it all, so hot right now, buildings made from glass. And that's what we're finding in America too. It's also very reflective. This is one of the five buildings that were represented in Lisbeth's chart, 800 K Street. Um, it's it's uh, uh, the overpass that's made of mirrored glass. And this is a photo that doesn't need any explanation to tell you why the birds confuse this with something they can fly through. And I've annotated the number of strikes that we've documented at each of these buildings down in the lower left. Another building that is problematic is 444 North Capitol Street. This is a photo I took at 7 a.m. I think it was in the spring. And you can see how realistic the reflection can be, especially when trees are reflected in the glass. Um, it's very hard to tell here where reality leaves off and illusion begins. The Thurgood Marshall building is the building that has had the most strikes of any building we've, we've reviewed. It's administered by the architect of the Capitol uh, who has been very responsive to the problem but hasn't solved it yet. The problem with the building is that you've got a sheer wall of glass uh, within which is an atrium containing three stands or maybe it's two stands of very tall like 40 foot high bamboo. Um, which is lit at night. And another minor feature of this building that do, we do think affects the collisions that these, these sidewalls actually converge, they're angled and they converge toward the glass, which tends to funnel the, the birds into the glass. So this is um, the Thurgood Marshall building at two times of day. At night on the right, uh, when the lights were completely lit. This is what the birds saw. And you can see how invisible the glass is. No, even humans would have problems with this. And then it, in the morning, it reflects Union Station. That's Union Station reflected in the glass. And so the birds think they can fly in with that, into that. Um, the architect of the Capitol has been very responsive about the lights. They now turn the lights off um, all year round. They started turning them off in migratory seasons in the atrium, but now they turn them off year round. The problem is that even the safety lights, you can't, you can't ask a building to turn off all the lights. They have to have enough for people to walk safely through the atrium. Um, and even those lights are lighting the trees enough so that it's still a problematic building. Similar building is 300 New Jersey Avenue. And this shows that building during periods of transparency on the left and reflectivity on the right. And this is an interesting building um, because we think that one of the reasons that tr transparency is such a problem here is that um, the birds see all these trusses that penetrate from the outside of the building in. And that was the artifice of the architect. That's what he wanted to do was, was um, make the create an ambivalence between the outside and the inside, or as we call it as architects, bring the, bring the outside in. Well, unfortunately, it brings the birds in too. They, they see these trusses as possible perches, and so they just fly right into the glass. Um, this is also a building that has converging walls, as you'll see. So um, only last year did this building um, start really worrying about the problem as these strikes increased and we kept 
um, meeting with them to see what they could do. Last year, they turned off all but the necessary safety lights in the atrium. And the, the result was pretty dramatic. We only had half the number of bird collisions that we've had in previous years just from turning out the lights. So it really does work. This is another transparency situation. It's the Court of Appeals at 430 E Street. And the situation here is that there's a large va va um, sort of park area on either side of this building, this, this addition, and there are trees in those plaza areas. So the birds think they can fly from one tree to another and they don't see the glass at all. Um, that, that, situation was what we call a fly-through condition. Another fly-through condition that has a happy ending is that um, at the Washington Convention Center, which was one of our most problematic buildings early on, it turned out this overpass at the L Street um, uh, overpass was the, the worst part of the building. And it was a classic fly-through situation. And what what we don't see as humans is remember the buildings are up at a, I mean, the birds are up at a higher level than we are. So when they're flying toward these buildings, they don't see the, this overpass as a three dimensional element. They don't see the bottom of it. They see it as a two dimensional element planar that they think they can fly through. So what we see is, is always a little bit easier to understand than what they see. Um, but what happened was the convention center was our most responsive building and they deserve a lot of credit for their responsiveness. By 2016, they had commissioned a film manufacturer, Solix Film, to install bird safe film on the outside of the overpass. And this is what the film looks like. And we like this film because it shows how easy and unobtrusive it is to completely fix the problem. After they install this in November of 2016, um, we've now seen bird collisions drop at that building by at least 85% and, and maybe even more. We haven't tabulated this year's figures yet, but the point is it's been highly effective and um, we're recommending this as a, as a, a technique for many buildings. It's, it's probably the least obtrusive and these, these films last 10 years. An interesting point about this is that I went to a convention for architects at the convention center uh, shortly after this was applied. And I walked through the overpass to get to the whatever seminar it was I was going to. And they have a exhibit room with all the manufacturers there. And so I harass them every year and I go down and tell them when, it, you know, come, come up and give us a a tour of your buildings and, and what are you doing? Why aren't you selling more products? So I was going down and harassing this guy named John that I knew and I said, John, when are you gonna install the, the film on the convention center? And he looked at me and he said, and we did it last November, it's there. You walked right by it. And I didn't even notice it, which tells you how um, unobtrusive it is. The problem is we keep building these buildings. This is 200 to 250 Mass Ave. This is a building not even completed yet. And we've found probably a couple dozen birds, maybe as many as 30, I, I can't remember how many, but that's, it's only been under construction for about two years. And this is the plaza of that building with two classic problems for birds right smack in your eye. The first one is this glass enclosed um, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, berm of ivy. And what this is functionally, I believe, I'm not sure of this, but I believe this is a vent, an air vent for the parking garage below, because we see fans moving the, the ivy within this structure. So you've got an attraction to birds um, completely enclosed with glass. The other problem here is another fly through situation in the back background of this, uh, that blue is actually a reflection of light across the street, but that is a classic fly through overpass and, and the, the, the glass is clear. There's no, no pattern or anything on it. And so we found birds at that location. And this is only half of the project that, um, that's gonna be created at this site. 
Residential collisions, these are very important because residential collisions may have one or two birds a year, but it's consistent all around the country. And the American Bird Conservancy is estimating that about half of the collisions that are tabulated are happening at people's houses, particularly things like sliding glass doors and, and large panes of glass. But they can also happen at very tiny windows. My mother has a just a simple double, double hung in North Carolina that, that um, a, gets a bird strike or did before we fixed it every year. Uh, so these add up and they can't be ignored. And, and you often, when we go to um, lectures, we often ask how many people in the room have heard or seen a bird collide with glass and virtually everybody will raise their hand. And many of these are at residences. So we need to pay attention and address how to fix residential build, build windows as well as commercial. I won't go into this at length, but there's a lot of science that's been developed on how to do bird safe design. Um, uh, the American Bird Conservancy has taken the lead in this and they have the most comprehensive document uh, that tells you how to, to design for birds. But then there are also other standards, some of which have been incorporated into laws like the San Francisco law that now mandates bird safety for certain buildings and the New York City law that was passed um, just last year that mandate, it's, it's the broadest law in the country that mandates bird safe construction for all uh, new and substantially remodeled New York City buildings. And it's a huge law and I hope it will be an inspiration to DC. But to get into what the principles are, some of them are obvious, which is use less glass. And it's gonna be hard to get architects to do that. But uh, the truth is that the more glass, the exponentially more collisions. In other words, 10 if you increase the amount of glass on your facade by 10%, it's going to result in 25% more bird collisions. So this is an example of that. This is Concilium Place in Toronto. These buildings are right in the same complex. And um, the Toronto Flat Project over six years tabulated 2009 deaths at the left-hand building and only 467 deaths at the right-hand building, proving that point. Um, but the most important rule guideline that, that the science has uh, determined is what we call the two by four rule. And this is a rule that tells you what, what density of pattern do you need to have on your glass to deter most bird strikes. And the, what the two by four rule says is that if your pattern is a, a maximum of two inches apart if the lines are horizontal or four inches apart if the lines are vertical, you will deter most bird strikes for the simple reason that um, if, if, these, if these patterns are visible to birds, they will realize they can't fly through that situation. So all of the products that I'll show you in a minute are um, variations on this two by four rule. We're often asked, well, can I put up a, a hawk thing here and will the hawks see my markers? And the answer is, yeah, they don't, they don't register that it's a hawk. You can forget that, these could be dots. But the problem is they have to be dense. You can't just put up one. Um, so we generally tell people for less, less obscuring the glass, you can get as much benefit. So some of the products that are now being marketed, marketed that incorporate bird safety principles are uh, fritted glass and pattern glass. The fritted glass on the left and the right um, show that various patterns can be incorporated in the glass. All patterns of glass though have to be on the outside of the glass. And that's because otherwise it, it, your pattern won't obscure the reflectivity. It may obscure the transparency, but you can still get reflections. In fact, sometimes if you, put the, if you put something like a shade on the inside of glass, you can actually make um, the reflectivity worse by making a mirror out of your glass. So all products that are marketed as bird safe have these patterns on the outside of glass. And uh, just parenthetically, that's one of the um, reasons it, it's hard technically to do this. 
for the glass manufacturers. And so that's why the development is has been rather slow. Um, the product in the middle, though, is an interesting product. It's called Ornolux, and it was developed by Arnold Glass in Germany. It's using the principle of UV reflectance, and because uh, birds can see ultraviolet light, but we can't. And so what Ornolux does is put the pattern of, it's a, it's a twig pattern that you can't even see because we can't see it. Um, if you hold up a piece of Ornolex and wiggle it around with, in different lights, you can, you can barely detect it in certain light grazing situations. But in a normal installation, the human can't see this pattern at all. Um, the problem is Ornolux is pretty expensive. It's, it hasn't been um, used enough for them to ramp up their manufacturing of it. And it's also, it's also been found that some of the simpler products are just as effective as Ornolux. Um, our architects often incorporate architectural features into the design for other reasons that make the buildings bird safe. So these are two examples where um, this, the one building on the left needed to cure glare in the building. And so this metal screen is part of the architecture and quite handsome. And then on the right, this was a sun, a sun control situation in another building that also makes the building bird safe. So, one of the arguments we use to architects is that you, it's not necessary to add any cost to these buildings. If you're thinking about bird safety from the start, um, very often you can combine some of the functionalities of your design with bird safety at zero extra cost. This is the Shaw Library in DC. And you know we have a lot of these new libraries now. We have the Tenley Library and um, the Anacostia Library and the Shaw Library, and they're all very innovative modern buildings. None of them were designed to be specifically bird safe, but virtually all of them are. And that's because the architect needed not to have glare in the reading room. And so you want a lot of glass, but you don't want glare. And so the solution is to put some sort of filtering screen. And I've been in this building, it's really a lovely building and the reading room is particularly, it has this wonderful translucent light that has no glare and the building is also bird safe. So you can make beautiful buildings and still have them bird safe. Um, these are two of the retrofit project products. And as I've said uh, before, it's much easier to incorporate these designs in the building to begin with rather than having to retrofit it. But if you have to retrofit it, um, these are some of the products. The Solix bird safe film is what the convention center used. It used the pattern on the right. And the left pattern has been used by the National Zoo at, uh, here. They have a couple of buildings that have been a problem. And so they've installed the horizontal pattern on it. Another pattern that's um, a Canadian pattern is feather friendly. They make a commercial film on the left that that's dotted. Actually, they have many patterns of this film. You can use dots too, as long as they don't, as long as they adhere to the um, the two by four rule. Um, but they also make strips that are wonderful for residential use. The way these work is you you put it on like masking tape, and there are dots embedded in the tape, and you press it down, and then when you peel the tape off, the dots stay on your glass. And this is made specifically for residential installations. Um, you can also do very creative things. We have a project in uh, Northeast DC called the Shining Stars Montessori School that two years in a row has killed over 50 um, cedar wax wings in their, their courtyard. And the kids were watching these birds collide with their glass and being traumatized for it. So what they've done is um, they now, during migratory seasons, they hang flags out in front of their windows so the birds can see them. Some of the solutions are really low tech. I have a problem window and I just stick post-it notes during migratory seasons and take them off afterward. Um, and if you have a party, you just pull off the post-it notes and put them back on after the party. Uh, and the Acopian bird saver is one of my favorite solutions. It's this, this um, product at, shown at this window probably cost around 50, 50 bucks. 
you can order it from a Copian bird saver to the specifications of your window. And all it is, you can make it at home too. All it is is parachute string hung at four inch intervals over your window. And it's called the Zen wind curtain because these birds, these uh, strings sway in the wind and they're really rather soothing. We have one at City Wildlife and people have said they'd miss it if it were taken away. They're also very highly effective. So in summary, um, Lizbeth, Lizbeth will tell you a little bit more about volunteering for Lights Out, but to summarize the overall situation, there are a lot of things we can do to help. We can actually fix this problem if people are aware of it. We can reduce our nighttime lighting. You analyze your glass to see, is it a problem? And if so, why is it a problem? Is it transparency or reflectivity? Then you can fix it with visual markers. Uh, another thing we haven't talked about but is implicit is that uh, you can shield your trees. If you have ficus trees or something inside your house, uh, shield them from view during migratory seasons. This doesn't apply to a little house plant, but some, some houses and buildings have fairly large landscape within atriums and they should consider shielding these from view. Uh, most important is spreading spreading the word because birds are beloved worldwide and they hold cultural, artistic and religious values for many people. And we can't ignore the negative effect of finding these birds on the humans who find them. It can be traumatic. Some people, we've even heard some people who dread going to work in the morning during migratory seasons because they know they're gonna find a dead bird at their building. Um, but there's something we can do about this. So next time somebody tells you they saw a bird hit a window, tell them to take action because together we can fix this. So Lizbeth, you wanna tell some about volunteering for Lights Out? Yeah, I, I wanna also be sure to thank our volunteers because as I said at the beginning, this is all volunteer. So without them, we would have uh, no data and no ability to, to effectively raise awareness as we have done. And just to add to what you were saying, Anne, too, what we find when we monitor is that it's not a whole building that's causing a problem. It's often some particular windows or a particular facade of the building. So there are um, ways to pinpoint um, what's problematic about a building. But um, yes, if you're interested, um, there's our contact information. We are monitoring right now. We'll monitor through the end of May. Again, it's a, sort of two downtown areas, but we're also interested if people would like to monitor a particular building, if they know of a problematic building in their neighborhood or near where they work. Um, that's how, for example, 430E got started, is that it was a, an individual who worked there who was noticing a great deal of bird collisions and she got um, staff to help her. And so it was like a, a, a multi-person effort to monitor that one building. And um, it was proven um, that there was a great problem there and, and they have, um, turned out some lights for us. So that that's a, a good story. Um, so yes, if you're interested, please contact us. Generally, volunteers um, go out once a week. So, um, you know, it's not a, a huge commitment, but the more volunteers we have, the more ability we have to um, document this problem and raise awareness. So thank you very much. I guess we can take questions now. Um, there was, and I was looking through, there's one question I don't know the answer to. Um, Chris, Chris, who I can see on the screen was asking if climate change has any impact on this issue. Um, uh, it will, uh, in a large scale. Um, th these bird, birds are moving north generally um, because of climate change, it's getting warmer. And we're gonna see that. I, I don't think in the 10 years, quite honestly, that we've been monitoring, we're able to tell you anything about that. But yes, certainly overall it will. And there are plenty of people working on this. And I wanted to say that I um, did drop into the chat um, three links for looking at, um, there's one um, from uh, Cornell, that so it gives you um, migration alerts. There's one that goes city by city alerts. That's the uh, wisconsin.edu. 
or no, that's the radar. And so there's also where you can see um, in real time the radar. Um, so if you want to check those out, they're there in the in the chat. Uh, we have a comment that our top four birds are the same as Baltimore's lights out stats. And yes, uh, Baltimore tends to find more birds than we do because they have more glass buildings um, and they're right on the harbor. Um, but the species are the same all around. It's remarkable. Um, has 800K tried to help? The simple answer is no. Um, we've contacted them repeatedly. The sad thing about that building is that, as you may know, they uh, put a whole lot of money into recladding half of that building. It, there are two parts of it connected by this overpass. And we approached them before they did the remodeling and alerted them to the problem. And they said, oh, no problem, we're remodeling. Um, we'll address it then. Well, not only did they not address it, but they made it worse in the part of the building that they've remodeled. So what we found generally is that the government buildings are much more compliant than the private buildings. Um, and I suppose that's because it's, you know, nobody's particular money. I, I don't know the reason, but we have found that. And 800K is, um, has been a big problem. Another problem building has proven to be the Martin Luther King Library. We're finding a lot of birds there. Um, and that's a government building, so we might have some success. Um, well, and Ann, that was a building too that was just recently remodeled. Right. Um, and you, you point out that we found 34 birds at 250 Mass, yeah. Almost. Yeah, last year. Yeah. So is that all the questions? Does anybody else um, have a question? Okay, uh, call us. We're also happy to come out to your particular building. If you have an issue, you know, we're local. Um, just call us and we'll come out and tell you what the possibilities are for fixing it. And of course, if you happen to be a designer or architect, or landscape architect, if you're a landscape architect, do not use mirrored glass in your landscapes. Um, I can tell you that right now. Uh, but we're happy to review designs and make suggestions and things like that. So, and, uh, and there's a couple of questions. One is, um, are there upcoming developments that we should be concerned about? Yes. Um, uh, there. At St. Elizabeth's, there may be a couple of buildings. The uh, National Capital Planning Commission website is a good place to check for upcoming construction because they review all of, all of the plans for upcoming construction. And also you can generally see the architects rendering for some of these buildings. So to the extent that we can, we're trying to get in at the ground floor for some of these buildings, but um, it, it's you know it's just our little nonprofit against these mega developers like at 250 and 2250 Mass. That's a particular problem because the the project is billed as an eco project, and yet it's being designed in a way that's going to kill birds. And it's too late to get to those architects, and they probably wouldn't have paid any attention anyway. So it can be very frustrating, but, uh, and that's why we need laws, sadly. I wish we could do this voluntarily, but it's looking as though um, we, and I'm an architect, so I can say this, we as a profession are not paying attention to this issue and will only pay attention to it if it's legislated. And there was another question about, um... Uh, what part of, of birds vision see the stripes? So when they look at the glass and are able to see when people have treated the wi uh, windows, what, what, part of, what part of their vision is perceiving those treatments? Uh, you mean uh, binocular versus, versus peripheral? I, I think that's what the question is. Yeah, it'll be binocular um, because they're looking at head. They won't see them three dimensionally. But that doesn't matter. There's they to you know it's the same way that they wouldn't run into a twig on a bush. 
they see it and therefore they steer away from it. Um, someone also asked, uh, how many volunteers do we need? Uh, we would love to have um, as many volunteers as we could get so that we could have um, the opportunity to have what a lot of Lights Out programs have is they have an early morning round, so at 5.30, so catching the birds when they first come down after migration, um, and then a later uh, round, like 7, 7.30, 8 o'clock, where they um, could catch the birds that are, that are getting um, in trouble because of the reflection. Uh, here's a question. Who do we call if we see a building that needs looking at? Uh, contact us at those websites. Um, we can either assign a volunteer or put it on our list of routes. And, and I'm, we're always happy to go out and look at individual buildings and determine is this likely to be a hazard? And people are also asking for um, links for the bird safe item. So that was what, um, bird, uh, feather friendly and excipient, are there other? Um, yeah, the things to, uh, let me just put it in the chat here. Okay. I don't know whose screen we're looking at right now. I know. Doesn't someone matter. someone shared their screen, I think, accidentally. Helen is sharing her screen. Thank you. Thank you, Trudy. Um, and there's also a question. Oh, well, you already answered that one. Great. So we'll just put up some links and we'll <laughs> yeah, I think um, these aren't links, but if you just Google these items, feather friendly, a copian bird saver, and Solix bird save film, uh, those are the three we have up on the on the website. And you know, since the New York law, more manufacturers are going to get into this business because there's going to be a market for it. So I expect to see more products coming up. And I also think on our Lights Out site, we also have um, some links to these as well. Yeah, we do. There's a lot of stuff, including our 10-year report, up on our website. Uh, links to some of these technical uh, publications also. Yeah, and I think I, just to say, Anne, I mean, I found like when I started doing this with you all in 2010, I just can't look at architecture the same. You know, I'm not a trained architect like you are. I just, I mean, it, we're sort of accustomed to thinking of glass as beautiful. And then you do this work and you realize um, the many problems with it. Yeah, sometimes in talks we say, we're about to ruin your life. And it, it's true, you know, you, you just can't. My husband is, is driven nuts by me. I say, oh, that's a bird problem. And, and you know, there are a couple things I didn't mention, but are hazards everywhere. Uh, glass railings on the top of buildings are a big hazard, and we don't even see them on the ground, but the birds collide with them. And bus shelters. We've had several uh, reports of birds killed at the glass bus shelters around the city. That is something I think we can do about, do something about. I think we can work with DDOT and see if we can't get some put up some sort of film on some of these bus shelters. Wow, I think this has been great, Anne. Thank you so much okay. for organizing this. Well, thank you and thank all the volunteers and call us, we'll end the meeting now and uh, just keep our uh, emails handy and let us know if we can help because that's what we're here to do. Bye all. Bye, thank you.